So the painting that I'm working on in this video is one that I started uh, in like late summer when I was teaching a class at my artist collective uh, studio and um, it was just an oil painting still life class on uh, studying the Dutch still life painters. I kind of left the painting for a little while and then uh, I came back to it recently to sort of finish it. It's beginning to be like fall time here and I think when I was painting this I felt like okay it's really f keeping me focused on paying attention to the details because if you've ever seen any of the Dutch painters uh, it's all so vivid and so high resolution there's so much detail and as I was doing this I really wanted to capture that and see how far I could take that as an exercise for myself and also as a way to start slowing things down and just reminding myself that my style of painting is really about focusing on the details and bringing them forward and just taking my time with it and having patience. I think I always kind of feel that way during fall time as well because as we sort of like head into the winter season, I don't know, time just seems to slow down a little bit for me. Um, and it just reminds me to like really pay attention to all the, the beauty as things change in the fall. I really don't like winter that much, so I'm trying to remind myself to see the beauty that I can before winter. And I think doing this painting was sort of meditative in that way. And as I was like thinking about all of these details and really focusing on bringing them out in this little painting, that I'm doing because it's a much smaller canvas than I usually work on. Um, it did remind me to pay attention to things I wouldn't normally pay attention to in general. This kind of came up because I uh, recently went on a little trip to Wisconsin. As I was there, um, I had a really cool little find and it was all about noticing the details and paying attention to something that you normally wouldn't. So that was really cool and it just reminded me of my process of painting here. So hope you guys enjoy it. Whenever I go to a museum, I always have to stop and look at the Dutch still life paintings. And I think it's really the deep contrast and the vivid flowers emerging kind of mysteriously from the darkness that really draws me in. And what's so interesting is that these still lives are really more than just the subject matter. These painters would intentionally imbue their paintings with different symbols that would represent morality and mortality. These things are often missed at first glance, so if you take a closer look in a lot of these historical paintings, you'll see little budworms eating away at leaves and petals falling off and decaying and wilting. Essentially, the idea here is that life is always imperfect, it always changes, there's always decay and death hiding just underneath the surface of something beautiful. And I think what's also a little bit ironic is that these paintings look exactly the same as they did hundreds of years ago. It's as if the beauty they're trying to achieve does somehow remain immortal, and yet at the same time maybe that's the idea, that these paintings represent the constant presence of both life and change and the tension that's always there. My painting started off as a master's study of Clara Peters' painting, and you can see the reference of hers right there that I'm working from. Um, although, as I was painting, I really found that I wanted to add my own spin and add my own elements and symbols into this painting. wondering why I just painted over some of the petals in the middle of this rose here with a very dark red. And um, this technique is called glazing, so as I was doing the original petal shapes in that area, I felt like they just weren't realistic enough, the contrast really wasn't quite right, so I took um, a transparent but dark red called alizarin crimson and put that over everything I was working on and then I added a little bit of um, thalo blue 
and I really deepen those shadows, and yet there's still some transparency in those particular pigments, so I was able to see the shapes underneath and then bring some of those petals forward with some highlights and this really gave a very realistic sort of contrast. And this is actually the technique that many master painters have used to create this kind of contrast in petals and folds of clothing and things like that. So unfortunately, I don't really have footage of the first underpainting stage, where I do Imprimatura and paint everything in a monochrome tone. So I kind of picked this up when I was in the mid to like late color blocking stage and then was beginning to put in the details and really all these layers here. So after I had gotten the basic shapes and basic colors down, as you can see in the petals of this daffodil, I really focused on the larger highlights and the larger lowlights and shadows before I went back in and put in all these like little textures and lines and things like that to make it look like a real petal. You'll also notice that as I'm adding in all of these layers and details, that I'm always working from dark to light, which means I prefer to have whatever shape I'm working on to be the darkest possible, and then I'll add in those highlights later. And this kind of process is going to be true for any oil painting you're working on, as oils are a very opaque medium, so those highlights and lighter colors can go right on top and have really good coverage over the dark colors. Also, going darker first than you might normally think is necessary will actually help you a lot to get those high contrasting value ranges that you need in a painting that deals with tenebrism and chiaroscuro, or basically the look where you're pulling some object out of the darkness. The immaculate execution and the rich tenebrism that these painters use reminds me metaphorically of moments of inspiration where you're thinking about something and then finally the idea emerges as if from the darkness and you see it vividly and completely. Or even when you're trying to remember something that's long gone and all of a sudden it just appears and hits you. And to me, visually, these flowers and these still lives represent that. Usually when I'm drawing from a historical reference or thinking about a historical genre of painting, I will update my own piece to sort of reflect contemporary values and act as like a bridge between the historical inspiration and what I'm thinking about now. But visually, I actually wanted my painting to almost look as if it could come from the 1600s because I think thematically, the intentions and story behind my painting remain pretty much the same. Um, it's almost as if this sort of painting becomes like a cultural relic and it intentionally reaches back into the past to kind of bring us back there. For me, these floral still lives just represent the process of memory, as I kind of mentioned before, of things being pulled out of this dark, hazy place into manifestation and back into remembrance. And the fact that this darkness always sort of surrounds and obscures the background also reminds us that these moments of clarity can drift right back into obscurity. Speaking of the past and relics of the past, let's go back to my Wisconsin trip and the little treasure hunt that I inadvertently found myself on. This little town in Wisconsin is so pretty and it feels like you're stepping back in time a little bit. 
I love visiting here and seeing my friend, and this time they had an arts and crafts fair that we were able to explore, and I saw a few local artists, which was really cool. But what is particularly special about this town is that they have some amazing antique stores and a used bookstore, which is one of the best ones I've ever seen. It feels like your quintessential cozy used bookstore, and it's everything that a book lover could ever ask for. Of course, I made a beeline for the poetry section because usually I can find some really awesome antique editions there, and I started flipping through things. Tennyson is one of my favorite poets, so of course I picked up all the editions that I saw from him, but I didn't really find any that caught my eye or seemed super old or rare or really unique, so unfortunately, not so much luck there. But my luck wasn't completely out, and sometimes you just gotta look in unexpected places. Okay, so I wanted to take you to my own little mini library and um, show you this book that I found. So I do collect these antique books when I get the chance. I mean, generally they're expensive, and if you can find one that's as old as the ones that I collect, I mean, you know, it's kind of rare, especially like in the States or if you're looking at like super small antique stores and things like that. But I have a number of, of them here, um, but at this particular bookstore that I went to uh, called The Booksmith in uh, Wisconsin, I um, at a different point had found antique books that were super cool, and um, one of them is uh, a little edition of The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. This is just an inexpensive pocket edition. I think it's from like the mid to uh, later 1800s. And um, I also have another one here, matching one, um, a poem by Tennyson. And books like these were generally made for people with lower income, students, things like that, so that they could buy books and have them for school or whatever, um, or just having uh, an opportunity to read something that would otherwise be in a really expensive edition. The other thing that I found at this bookstore the last time I was there was um, this, and it seems pretty unassuming, but it's actually a facsimile of Lyrical Ballads by Wordsworth and Coleridge. They modeled it after the original first edition, one of the copies held at the British Museum, I believe. And it's super cool because I think they went as far as, um, yeah, printing it on laid paper. These look very similar to um, how it would have been printed in 1798. Now, surprisingly, when I was there at this bookstore, I actually did not find anything that I was super head over heels for. Um, there were a few, like, Tennyson editions, but nothing that was super rare or exciting or anything like that. Um, so I was a little bit bummed, but, uh, there are lots of cool antique stores, um, around this small town in Wisconsin. And most of them don't even carry that many books, so, um, usually furniture and things like that. But on a table, I spied this very unassuming little tiny book. Um, I'll take it out of the wrapping in just a second. And as I was looking at it, I passed it by at least once. And then I went back to it because I'm like, you know what? There's something about this that makes me think it's a lot older than, than what it looks. So anyway, I uh, carefully took it out of the wrapper. I don't know if I was supposed to. I will say, if you're not used to handling old books, um, definitely be careful with them. Uh, they're extremely delicate and you never ever want to open them up quickly or um, in a way that would break their spine. Um, that really can just destroy the book and the binding. Um, I picked up this book and I was looking through it and I realized that it's so much older than I first thought. Um, it's actually printed in 1826 and that is the oldest book that I've ever come across in the wild, at least as of yet. So I was pretty excited about that. And I also in grad school have worked on the William Blake archive. So I know 
a good amount about 18th and early 19th century printing processes and conventions and the things that they use, the type of paper they use, the typeset, all of that. So I kind of knew what I was looking at. It can be a little tricky to identify something so old. I mean, generally they're going to have your title page with the actual year of when it was printed, um, but that isn't always the case. So there are some things you can look for to make sure that it is actually really old. One of those things is going to be your typeset impressions. So because uh, the pages were basically run under a pressured printing press, um, you're going to have the paper kind of have a little bit of an indent of what those letters on the back side of it. So if you're very gentle, you can kind of feel for that. The other thing that you want to look for is the type of paper that's used. Um, a lot of times they will use laid paper, like I mentioned before, which is going to have a certain sort of vertical and horizontal linear pattern in the paper, but this one is just wove paper, which is the other kind of historical paper you would use, and there's really no pattern, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not quite old. You kind of have to see like how the paper's aging and the stain marks and things like that. Surprisingly, this little guy does actually have a print engraving plate included in it. So that means that the publisher either had a engraver on their staff or they outsourced um, this little portrait of Thomas Gray to be engraved and included in this book. And that always adds to the cost. And it's a big selling point too for people to be able to have images in the books that they read because normally that was really hard to come by for at least someone not of the gentry class. Um, and creating prints of images was a completely separate process from creating the actual text and laying out the typeset. Uh, they're done basically by two different industries, two different jobs and people working on it. So it's pretty neat that this little um, copy actually has a uh, image of Thomas Gray in it. I was just so ecstatic when I saw this because I'm like, this is the kind of thing I was looking for. Um, and it was at a completely different shop, just on a table, randomly, not with anything else. And, you know, I almost overlooked it because it looks so unassuming. And I thought that maybe it was just something beat up and it wasn't really that old. But again, you know, you gotta give things a, uh, a second look. it's so interesting when the seemingly random things that I'm thinking about or that I come across connect to each other and share the same theme. So coincidentally, Thomas Gray's most famous poem, Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard, deals with exactly the same themes as our Dutch painters, and he meditates on the distant past, trying to resurrect or recreate memories and legacies that are now unknown. Elegy written in a country churchyard is like a ballad to people lost to history, the ordinary ones that never became known, at least not outside their circles and villages. And these people, Gray imagines, um, their unknown potential as silent poets, unrealized heroes, or even oppressive rulers, all because they were born to a life of quietness and mundanity. And yet, here are their graves in the country churchyard, which is really the only proof that they existed at all. It's a somber and beautifully imaginative poem about human legacy and how easy it is for everything we experience today to be completely lost in time. Just like the striking flowers emerge in the Dutch paintings, so does Gray's poetic imagination draw the what could have been from the darkness of history. And I think without really realizing it, it's that same sentiment that I wanted to focus on as I really emphasize the vividness of life in my painting and not focus so much on the darkness and death and decay. I wanted to emphasize that there is so much to see and take in in life. We at least can try not to forget ourselves. And I think when people look at this painting, 
I just want them to be able to find little bits and pieces of light in surprising places. As I stop to take a little bit of a break and think about the finishing touches that this painting needs, I have one final thought on Thomas Gray and just this whole theme of memory and legacy. So Thomas Gray actually only published 13 poems during his lifetime in the mid-1700s, which is kind of hardly anything compared to his contemporaries. And I suppose this goes to show that quality and purpose is so much better than producing as much as you possibly can, because Thomas Gray quickly became a foundational poet for centuries to come, and it's part of the reason why even a small pocketbook of his poems was made and why it survives today. Mm -hmm.